Man's connection to the bee goes back thousands of years. Mead may be the oldest alcoholic drink in the world, even older than agriculture. The Hindu scriptures mention both honey and mead. Bacchus, the Greek god of wine, is said to have taught beekeeping as a sideline. Holy Island is regarded as the cradle of Christianity but even today produces Lindisfarne mead, nectar of the gods. Like the common honeybee that has helped us through time, the bumblebee also feeds on nectar and gathers pollen to feed its young. These creatures are beneficial to humans and the plant world alike. Albert Einstein put it bluntly. No bees, no food for mankind. The bee is the basis for life on this earth. This crucial relationship with the bee is now under threat. Bumblebees are often referred to as nature's pollinator. If they come out of the environmental equation, all sorts of problems will occur. So why has this decline taken place? We've now lost some 97% of our wildflower meadows. Most people are now in agreement that the loss of mixed farmland that contained vital pollen and nectar sources for the bumblebee is now almost a thing of the past. What we've really got to do is to develop a mechanism where this vital pollen and nectar source is resupplied. Operation Bumblebee is a project um, sponsored and managed by Syngenta Crop Protection in the UK. Its objective and aims are to sow a thousand hectares of pollen and nectar on a thousand farms over the next three years and hopefully stem the decline of the British bumblebee. Well, Operation Bumblebee has evolved from a number of projects. 18 to 20 years ago we started looking at some work to develop field margins using some of our products to take out some weed species and help the margins evolve into something which was environmentally beneficial. That work evolved into a project which is called the Buzz Project which looked at a range of different sorts of habitats sitting alongside a farmed conventional crop to see whether or not we could sit conventional profitable farming alongside a vibrant countryside and to look at how those two different systems interacted. We could see that there was going to be a greening of UK agriculture after the Kerry report. We felt we needed to know what this impact this was going to have on the UK farmer and because Syngenta Crop Protection is, is part of UK Agriculture PLC then it was going to affect us if it affects our us, it'll affect our customers and we needed to know something about that. So this, this uh, five-year project was set up on six different farms around the UK, seven different habitats were sown on there and after two years we were seeing some phenomenal results particularly from bumblebees where we replaced habitats and so we thought well is there something here that we could actually take tangibly out from the um, ologists of CEH, Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, and take it into the, into the farming situation. So it was the real white coat to welly boot technology transfer that, that, we're, that we're exhibiting in Operation Bumblebee. In the last 10 years, um, there have been some real big changes in my field of research. Basically, uh, what we've started to do is get a really good handle on the causes of declines of the key farmland species, birds, butterflies, bees. We also know really what, they, what we need to put back into the countryside in terms of their habitats, what they, they require to complete their life cycle. Um, we've also done a lot more research to underpin the agri-environmental prescriptions and, and the other thing is that the really critical change in the last few years has been massive farmer participation. We have to take charge of its destiny and manage it accordingly. We chuck it down, which is what we're going to do there. We've sown a bit of seed, we'll do 
It seems that's a our delivering Operation Bumblebee to the farmer in the form of training days at specific training centres across the UK which farmers can come to. We tend to work in small groups, perhaps anything from 8 to 15 farmers in the day. We'll spend 75% of the time in the classroom, the rest of the 25% will be spent outside in the field. If you can't do the crop bit, this bit is of no significance to a professional farmer. If you look at what you know and understand and the guy meets your approval, yeah, I might pay attention to this. It's the 20 kilo per hectare grass and legume mix that is Operation Bumblebee. Um, so here it is. Um, I had a look at it when it was only just a couple of weeks old and everything was there, it's all on its way. We're dominated by annuals, but the crop we've sown is this one down here, which are the perennials. Chop this lot out the way, leave the cuttings on the heavier more weedy soils, you'd have to remove the cuttings. All the guy on the tractor needs to know is that, that if you go too fast, you're going to do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. He actually wants to chop them off and, and, and leave it there. That within, particularly in this weather, within four or five days is of no significance at all. Okay. I think today has been most useful for the so we this as well. management skills needed to do these margins. It's like any bit of farming. We don't just put seeds in and run away and leave them. We have to manage the crop and we need to know how to manage these margins. And that is what's been sadly lacking, I think, in, uh, in the environmental schemes up to now. If you stand above and you can't see your crop, then the canopy is over the top of it and it's working against it. A lot of the bits we are using were the less productive bits of land uh, and that sometimes we're using the worst bits to try and establish uh, these margins and wonder why we haven't made a very good job of it. Well, it's probably because it's on the worst bit of land and not on the best bits of land. Uh, but financially, the returns are making it worthwhile and because we're interested in the shooting side, uh, we were probably going to do some of this work anyway without getting paid for it. So the fact that we are getting paid for it is, is helping. Seeing is believing for the farmer. When he goes out of the door at the end of the day, he has to go home and establish that margin himself. And so if he can spend some time in the field with Marek and myself, get it in his mind's eye, he knows exactly where he can cite it, sow it, uh, manage it, um, and it'll be best for him, for the bumblebees and for other farmland biodiversity. Years, you know. But the farming value, the wildlife interest for people living here has to be all linked together anyway, doesn't it? Oh yes, Yeah. absolutely, because the whole island community is sort of involved one way or the other, either with, with the fishing industry or the shellfish yeah, industry yeah, you know, yeah, or yeah, farming. Yeah, you know? yeah. Was this cropped? This was, this was always spring barley. It was always golden promise spring barley. <laughs> it ran quite well. Yeah. Anybody that can farm for food can farm for wildlife. This was a spring barley stubble home. I'm choosing a site. This is, a sunny, uh, sheltered position is ideal. Two years ago. This is year three. Also important is to put the new habitat close to potential nest sites. Right. Nope. And, and this is the area we might think of doing something. This is the area. We've got, we've got it's half a hectare. We, uh, we joined it, I think, the very first year it was formed. What lives here in the way of wildlife? Uh, Peewit. Uh, red shanks, but not as much red shanks nest now as they used to be. Uh, ground birds, pipits, absolutely hundreds of pipits. The next thing to consider is what wildlife is already there. The new habitat should complement rather than replace what exists. Lots of species of butterflies. You want to you want to add the bumblebee bit, but not at the expense of what we what you've already got. That's right. Yeah. yeah that's yeah, right. Yeah. That's correct. But it really is. It's a lovely spot, isn't it? And, it is. and it's nice for somebody to say, I've got the wildlife, I want to keep it, I want to do more with it. That's right. Yeah, well, I've always been keen on the, on, the, on the wildlife all my life. We're on one of these very special edges that I want to show you. We produce food behind me, but not at the expense of the wildlife. What we're using here are many of the farming skills to produce the crop, and we're bringing those skills to the wildlife. The current budget for cap reform in the EU is uh, 2.5 billion and in the UK the new entry level scheme alone has a budget annually of 400 million pounds. Our role um, in these schemes is, is to help monitor uh, the effectiveness of these schemes to demonstrate that the taxpayers money is being spent uh, effectively. After doing statistical analysis of the data, we have confidence in the conclusions. We can then feed that back to the farmer, we can feed that back to DEFRA, and we can change agricultural prescriptions and policies with confidence that we've got the right answer. 
Management prescriptions are really uh, recipes uh, or, or guidelines uh, for land managers and farmers to help them actually create wildlife habitat on farmland. There were five species of bumblebee which were decided that we ought to have a look at them because we weren't finding them. They were found, they were written about, they were common up to the 50s. Why had they gone? Where had they gone to? Oh, we went out, the first thing we did was go and have a good look and see if we could find any of these. Well, one species we found, two workers. That was all, just two, nothing else. And that really got us quite worried. And then we realised these things were, were being found on something like red clover all the time. And that really became quite exciting because that fitted exactly into farming systems. Farming systems had used clovers as part of their cycle of growth and production for years. And the bumblebees obviously loved it. We're standing near two areas of tusky grass. They look like the same sort of place until you look at where the sun is. And on, on that side, there's an area that's in shadow. And on this side here, there's an area that's in sun. Queen Bumblebee uses this for two different purposes. On the sunny bit is where she likes to put her nest because she needs to be warm. But if she hibernates in the sun on a warm winter's day, she can get warmed up. She can come out and then freeze. So she hibernates in the shade which is the other part of the tusky grass. The queen going into hibernation carries the responsibility of the next generation, therefore the perpetuation of her own species. Certainly the changes in agriculture, where we're looking at not farming within the first two metres of a field edge, should provide a greater opportunity for these rough tussocky structures so vital to overwintering for bumblebees. Plenty of thatch in it. But, you know, now we're looking for old runs. Now, you can see in there where the vole's gone in. And what she'll do, she'll look down there and she'll see if she can find a run going into a little nest ready-made as a ball like that underground. So there are two basic systems, some nest underground like that, yes. some nest on the surface like this. Right, different bumblebees. Different species. Here you've got a typical place the queen's going to look for a, a nest, if she nests on the surface. Lots of nice, easily gathered strawy material, quite warm, it actually feels warm even though it's a cold day. And what she'll do is crawl into here and if it's got enough material she'll actually take it like this and she'll chop it and she'll turn it around actually weave it it's incredible like a tennis ball like that a little hole in the middle which is where she'll sit just like that just like that yeah isn't that amazing bumblebees start to emerge from about the middle of march onwards the first thing they do is they wake up pretty hungry it is vital that they get tanked up on pollen and nectar just as quickly as they can The next task is for her to find a nest site. You can see her at this stage flying in a very zigzaggy fashion, close to the ground, actually checking out all the nooks and crannies for her new home. Pollen has two vital uses for the queen bee. Firstly, she uses it to develop her ovaries. Secondly, she collects a ball of pollen that she takes back to the nest on which she will actually lay the eggs and the first colony develops. Red dead nettle, white dead nettle, particularly goat and grey willow, all these early food supplies, so often overlooked, so often missing on the modern farm, are absolutely vital at this stage. If those aren't available, the queen starves to death before she's even started the next generation. The Operation Bumblebee Seed we're about to sow is very small and must be left on the surface. We need a firm, fine seed bed with a ring roll either side of the broadcasting operation. This can be done in spring or autumn, depending on the soil type. Now it's connected to soil, now it's on the top, the rest of it is up to sunshine and a drop of rain and away it goes. It's a lovely May afternoon, it's rained all day. We're waiting for the wildlife, but it's tucked in the hedge. I shouldn't be tucked in the hedge, but I should be tucked up by a fire somewhere. What I want to show you is the difference between managed and unmanaged habitats. 
This is the natural regen. It really is a farming nightmare. What we've got is brome, wild oats, black grass. This situation could occur now on many farms because they will be using six metre set aside. You're not allowed to farm within two metres of a hedge and you've left nature to do, quite honestly, its worst. The natural regeneration that you saw was also in this field, but it was sitting on top of the grass and wildflower mix. Let's have a closer look at this wildflower with management. What we've got now are one or two annuals that we can keep in check with mowing. We've removed the brome, the wild oats, the black grass. These were initially threatening the sown mixture. This is a 30 plot experiment. One of the problems we've had over the last six years is the margins aren't living long enough. With the margins behind us, we're looking at with grass, without grass, different ranges of clovers and legumes to see how long we can make these plots last. This is a sneak preview of some of tomorrow's mixtures. This one contains a high percentage of legumes, red clover and sandfoin. This one is less legume and more tall tussocky grass. The idea is that in the future, we can provide a greater range of opportunity with a greater range of mixtures. We're very proud of what we've done here at Upton and our margins and clover um, experiments are going really well. We run trials and also training day for Operation Bumblebee. Well, in the field we call Bishop's Plough, uh, we've got what I call a sandwich margin. Whereas when we first put them in, um, couldn't really decide where was the most appropriate to have the flowers and where was the most appropriate to have the clover. So we've put a strip which is half and half clover and flower mix all the way along the length of the field. Up again. And you can see the, the leg is narrower. There's no big spade-like collecting area for the uh, pollen. The tail is... It is very difficult these days to get people out in the field and show them and let them understand by feeling it how practical conservation and agriculture work together. What we are doing here is we generate data for Mike for his research on bee populations. He shows us, shows us how to identify bumblebees, um, how to count them, how to distinguish males from females and many other very interesting things. And this leads to additional knowledge about how to improve field margins in order to get rare species back into the countryside. Upton Farm for me is one of the model farms that show how you can find the good balance between practical conservation and productive agriculture. What we try to do is find programs that suit the situations in the countries where we operate. Bumblebees are very special indicator, I think, for the UK. In other countries in Europe, it's probably other species to achieve. In France, for example, we are working also in partnership with Earthwatch at the moment in a project about biodiversity in vineyards in the Bordeaux area. In Spain, we are looking into the wetlands of the Doñala Valley and conservation agriculture means soil conservation agriculture in order to prevent sediments from being washed off of the field and into the waters where they don't belong. And those are examples of projects that we try to spread in the rest of Europe, more or less always following the same approach practical conservation and productive agriculture. So yeah. what someone else wants to do, He's be brave. No. Come on then. Look, have you played crush it? Yes, no, you won't crush it. Just just bring your fingers closer to mine. Go on, go on, go on. I oh, crush yeah. it, I crush no, you it. No, it's hard. <laughs> Don't forget the outside of a bumblebee is hard. Take it firmly, Juan, you'll be surprised how much it actually collapses. What it will do is bite you with its mandibles. We get a group of farmers together and various people from various organisations, including Syngenta, um, come out and, and train the farmers in the field, which is the place to do it. It's helped us enormously with our stewardship application and it's made our arable a lot more profitable and it's made the estate a not, lot nicer place to be. There's a good business reason, there's a good premium. In today's uh, farming environment, we're all trying to be more green, um, and all these payments that have taken away in modulation as a chance to recoup those in uh, stewardship, which all these uh, margins, etc., all help us to get into stewardship, either entry level or higher level. <laughs> Half right, maybe? I would have thought so, just yeah. about. A bit more, uh, maybe. It's going to be a good one. It's going to be a good one. But we're getting up to your wildlifey bit that I've heard all about. 
Well, what we've got here is this is our Operation Bumblebee mix. We've got the red clover in this margin here. And this bit? Well, we took it a stage further in. This is what I like to call my uh, sandwich margin. And uh, these fl the flowers, the wildflowers we've sown in here, also good for wildlife. Um, I didn't tell you you could do this. No. Sometimes you have good ideas without you, Murray. <laughs> what you find is that you get bumblebees in different parts of the margin at different times, and the bumblebee can complete its whole life cycle within this 20 metre margin. It's got everything it needs. The tusky at the back, we can see. The tusky at the back, and the tusky the against flowery, the crop. Tusky against the crop. Bells, bells. As another growing season comes to an end and autumn approaches, it's harvest for the farmer and harvest for wildlife. The queen at this stage is building herself up into peak condition to survive the rigors of winter where she hibernates. Once a farmer's uh, signed up and completed his day's training, what we actually ask him to do for that day's training is to actually purchase uh, one hectare of the pollen and nectar mix, which is the Operation Bumblebee mix. He then commits to sow that uh, margin on his farm or as a field corner, whichever suits. On the training day, he'll receive a pack with information about the project, an identification kit for bumblebees. He'll also receive some signage, so if he does choose to take people around the farm and show them the, the margins, then he's able to actually show that that's Operation Bumblebee in action and actually being delivered. We're preparing a perfectly good seed bed for winter wheat. That's going to be drilled half to three quarters of an inch deep. But behind me, the Operation Bumblebee crop requires something slightly different. We need a finer seed bed 